الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وصلى الله على نبينا أمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. I know the last time that I sat in this place with this microphone in my hand, <laughs> it wasn't as nice as it is today. Um, but alhamdulillah, um, today inshallah ta'ala we're going to discuss something that really concerns us all. And that is uh, matters that heart in the heart. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran that when we allow enough time to go by without the remembrance of Allah, without, you know, engaging our worship in the way that we're supposed to, as time passes, our hearts harden over time. As Allah says in the Quran, فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدُ فَقَسَدْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ That فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدُ that a, a long period of time passed wherein their hearts were negligent of the religion of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ right and their hearts became hard وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ and most of them many from amongst them are fusaq they are fasikun they are rebellious sinners so inshallah ta'ala tonight as the scholars say Ma'rifatu al-illa nisful ilaj Understanding or recognizing your disease is half of your cure So inshallah ya rahmukullah Tonight I want to kind of revisit something that I talked about in Ramadan uh, During the month of Ramadan um, Alhamdulillah we had the opportunity to look through uh, the chapter of Al-Raqa'iq from Sahih al-Bukhari We were covering the chapter of the matters that soften the heart but before we actually went into that chapter, there was an introduction that I gave uh, to matters that heart in the heart. Because in order for you to understand how important softening your heart is, you got to understand the danger and why your heart is hard and the danger of it being hard. How did it get hard? What it looks like when it's hard? And then we can talk about how to soften it. All right. We don't just jump into matters that soften the heart and we don't even we, we don't even know whether some people might walk right past and say, well, that don't apply to me because my heart is not hard and walk right out of the class. But you say, wait a minute, slow down for a second. Let me let me take a, a shot. Let me take a picture of your heart and show you what it looks like. And then you can decide whether or not this applies to you. Right. So Alhamdulillah, I'm going to revisit that. Uh, that introduction to that class and perhaps the more that I come inshallah we can start looking through some of those chapters some of those ahadith in that chapter inshallah ta'ala um, losing our hearts um, hardening our hearts um, it can be a good thing because in hardening the heart or the heart hardening uh, it actually sends us on a journey to self discovery we start to journey to find out how did my heart get like this how, how, what happened to me i used to be a fairly decent muslim i used to be an okay muslim you know i used to get up for tahajjud and now i don't right the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told um uh muad he said yeah muad inni la uhibbuka fillah or was it abdullah ibn amr ibn al as he said yeah abdullah inni la uhibbuka fillah la takun mithlu fulan he said, Abdullah, I love you for the sake of Allah, but don't be like such and such who used to get up at night and then he stopped getting up at night. He stopped. And for many of us, that's, that's many of us. Think back when you were a new shahada, you were a new convert to Islam and you wanted to do everything. Everything you learned immediately you wanted to practice. You were that enthusiastic about Islam and then as time progressed, we begin to digress, right? Not progress, we begin to, you know, regress, excuse me. We begin to regress and go backwards. And some of us unfortunately have, you know, literally become worse than what we were when we first took Shahada, when we first became Muslim, you know? And that's a, that's a problem because there's a process that got us to that point that obviously that we were not paying attention to. All right. Um, so losing our hearts or pieces of it uh, can be a good thing because it sets you off on a journey to self-discovery. And much like when you do research, you end up coming across information about yourself that you actually didn't even know before. 
as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the community of the Prophet وسلم, when they fell into the um, the the um, the scandal about Aisha and they were accusing her of adultery and things like that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the community لا تحسبوه شر لكم بل هو خير لكم don't consider it an evil thing but actually consider it a good thing because the fact that you fell into this you're going to learn from that ayats were revealed about that situation that is going to help you to never fall into that again and this also helps us to you know I, I hear a lot as I said before people say well oh he has mistakes oh he made mistakes who is not gonna make mistakes any person who has jumped out on this platform to be a da'i imam student of knowledge any person who has ever grabbed this microphone right here right has made mistakes and it's imperative you're going to make mistakes why because you're going to develop you're going to grow and you don't grow from your success, you grow from your failures. Has anybody grown anything from their successes? You grow from your failures, not from your successes. Any of the prophets and messengers, alayhi salam, that was tested, when you look at um, uh, Prophet Yunus, alayhi salam, Nun, right? That incident with him being swallowed by the well, held there for a particular period of time, and it was in the belly of the well that he realized that he, made, that he erred. It wasn't on the other side. It was in the belly of the well that he realized he erred. And then Allah responded immediately. That he called out in the belly of the well, La I get emotional every time I quote this ayah, man. Because for some of us in our lives, we are actually in the belly of the well. In our own personal lives, right? Not literally, you know, figuratively, metaphorically. We are in the belly of the well in our own personal lives. We would like everybody to think that our lives are perfect. But the fact of the matter is that you are in the belly of the well in your own personal life. And it was in the belly of the well that Yunus realized he erred. Not on the other side of the belly of the well. As a matter of fact, Allah says in another verse, لَوْلَا إِذْ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ لَلَّبِثَ فِي بَطْنِهِ إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ That if it was not for the fact that Yunus, before this incident happened, he used to be amongst those, a musabbihin, he used to be amongst those who used to praise Allah and worship Him much, he would, have, he would have remained in the well. If he had not made Tawbah, he would have remained in the well until the day that everyone was resurrected. So it wasn't on the other side of the well, outside of the belly of the well that he realized that he erred. It was inside the belly of the well that he sat there and he realized, I shouldn't have left. I shouldn't have gave up giving da'wah as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded me to. Allah says, وَذَهَبَ وَذُنُّونَ إِذْ ذَهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا فَظَنَّ أَنْ لَا نَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ And Dhunun, the, the companion of the well, when he walked away in anger from his people, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the well to swallow him and hold him there. Don't shred his skin, don't break his bones, just hold him right there. And some of us, our mistakes, they hold us right there. Until we make toba, we repent, and we realize I was wrong. And once you come out on the other side of that, you've learned so much. So this whole notion, this whole idea, oh, he made some mistakes. He's supposed to make mistakes. That's how we get better. We're supposed to make mistakes. As Abu Bakr anhu, when he became the Khalifa, he got on the minbar and he gave a khutbah. And he said, Ayyuhal qawm, inni wulitu alikum wa lestu bi khayrikum. He said, oh people, I have been placed over you, but I am not the best from amongst you. The ultimate in humility. He said, فَإِنْ أَحْسَنْتُ فَإِنْ أَحْسَنْتُ فَأَعِينُونِي وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُ فَقَوِّمُونِي He said, if I err, فَقَوِّمُونِي Straighten me out. If I err, straighten me out. He said, وَإِنْ أَحْسَنْتُ And if I do well as your leader, فَأَعِينُونِي Then assist me, aid me. And this is the blueprint for dealing with our leaders in the community. If they are, then we straighten them out. We point them in the right direction. With rift, with lean, with generosity, with, with, you know, in the same manner we would want to be advised. 
It doesn't, this is something that we have to understand that because you were wronged doesn't make you right in approaching the person that wronged you in any way that you want to. Your anger and your frustration doesn't make you right. Sometimes we think that I'm right to do it any way that I want to because I was wronged. So we go to the imam, we say, sound like your brother imam, I got some advice I want to give you. I mean, come on, who, who, would you like to be approached like that? Wallah alazim, I can show you emails people sent me. Assalamu alaikum brother, um, don't even call me by my name. Like, no no respect. I mean, from the beginning of the email. It's like, assalamu alaikum brother Shidi. You know, um, I just want to give you some advice. Hopefully you'll take it from me. It's like, <laughs> I mean, come on. No adab. No, you know, mashallah, you know, the work that you do in the community, mashallah, much appreciated. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless you, continue to guide you. Um, if you could just give me a couple of minutes of your time, I would just love to, you know, share something with you. Who would reject that? Nobody would reject that. Because you already led with what? Kindness. You led with kindness. You led with validating the person. Imams go through hell trying to you know, give their all to the community only to be told that you're never good enough. You're never good enough. And you're always viewed through the lens of the mistakes that you've made. Oh, he got some mistakes. What about all of the good that he did? <laughs> did the Prophet Wasallam not validate some of his Sahaba, those who made some mistakes, fell into error, and then he turned, I guess we're going to say now, oh, Shadid Muhammad said, the Sahaba made mistakes. <laughs> it's all documented, dude. Like, I mean... I'm not making this up, <laughs> right? The hadith of Hatib ibn Abi Balta who sent a letter to Quraysh telling them that the Prophet ﷺ was coming, right? And Allah revealed to him that he did it. And then he asked Hatib, he said, why did you do this? Why did you do this? And he said, you know, take it easy, O Messenger of Allah, let me explain, right? And he said, I didn't do it because I'm a disbeliever. I didn't do it because I'm a hypocrite. I didn't do it because I love the kuffar. I didn't do it for any of those reasons. But I'm not from Quraysh. And I feared that when you guys entered into Mecca, y'all was going to have no mercy on people who were not Qurayshi. Because you and the rest of your companions, y'all all from Quraysh. I'm not from Quraysh. Umar stood up and he said, O Messenger of Allah, da'ni adrib unuk hadha munafiq. He said, O Messenger of Allah, let me strike the neck of that hypocrite. Umar was judging him where? based upon the mistake that he made. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لَا يَا عُمَرْ إِنَّهُ شَهِدَ بَدْرًا He said, no, Umar, he participated in the battle of Badr. The Prophet ﷺ, what did he do? He didn't allow his one mistake to overshadow the good that he did in the past. No, I'm not going to hold you to that for the one mistake that you made. Even though it was considered treason, even though Islamically this is considered kufr. But the Prophet ﷺ heard him out, listened to, no imam gets on the, the minbar and makes a mistake intentionally. <laughs> it's, we did research, your witch had to another, your perspective, you know, I mean, it happens to the best of us. To the best of us. Shaykh Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala was reported that he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ma'iyah of Allah, that Allah is with us in his essence. And people ran with that. Ran with it. So much so that he had very few students of knowledge after that. It was a huge scandal around Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala. You know, I mean, like, it, it happens. It happens. But mistakes um, can have the, you know, propensity to push us forward and to make us actually better people. So the reason why the chapter is called al raqaiq you know, matters that soften the heart, as Shaykh Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala said, he uh, nusus alati turaqiku kulub is called the chapter of the matters that soften the heart because in that chapter there are nusus, there are texts from the sunnah that soften the heart, that make the heart soft. He said, ay yuraqiku kulub wa ma yulinu hunna dharika li anna al-qalb qad tuqsa bil ma'asi wa kathratu al-ghafla fa tahtaju ila shay yuraqikuha. He said, it's called the book of the matters that soften the heart. He said because these are texts from the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam that are designed to soften the heart. He said the hearts can become hard due to sin, due to ghafla, due to negligence, heedlessness, and tahtaju, that they are in need of things that will soften the heart. All right? Um, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, listen to this quote of Ibn Qayyim. If you're sitting at home, 
in the comfort of your living room. You're on the couch, just got home from work, put down your bags, you prayed awesome, and you have the luxury of sitting in your living room right now with a cup of tea, cup of coffee, and you can just unwind and get ready for your Friday night, right? Listen to this comment by Ibn Al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. He said, Al-Qulub aniyatullahi fil ard, fi ardihi. He said, the hearts are the vessels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the earth. He said, فَأَحَبُّهَا إِلَيْهِ أَرَقُّهَا وَأَصْلَبُهَا وَأَصْفَاهَا He said, in the most beloved hearts to Allah, the most beloved hearts to God are the hearts that are the softest, the hearts that are the most moist, and the hearts that are the most pure. Soft, pure, moist heart. These are the most beloved hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His first comment, he said that the hearts are aniyatullahi fil ard. He said the hearts are the vessels of Allah in the earth. A vessel or water skin, what they used to use, right? This is a cultural reference. We don't know anything about vessels or water skins. We don't carry water in a water skin. We have water bottles, right? So understand the Prophet Wasallam's culture. When they traveled, they would have, you know, strap around them and they would have a leather case where they would put water in to be, be able to carry it with them similar to or equivalent to a water bottle today he said that the hearts are the aniyatullah it is the vessels of allah or the tools that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in the earth what what are these hearts carrying for allah he said that the hearts are the vessels of allah on the earth a vessel is used something, a water skin, you know, uh, is used to carry something. What are the hearts carrying for Allah? Huh? Zikr. Reminder. Dhikr, reminder. What else? What are the hearts carrying for Allah? Love? Absolutely. If Allah wants to show you love, right, how does Allah do that? Guiding the heart of somebody else to come and extend some mercy to you. Right? Allah is the changer of the hearts. Muqallib al qulub The changer of the hearts. So you might be pulled over on the side of the road somewhere with a flat tire. And someone just sees you and happens to pull over. Hundred people ride past you. See you pulled over, your tire's flat, you out sweating, old t-shirt wet, you're trying to take the tire off. Hundred cars ride past you. And then this one car pulls over. The person gets out and says, hey, can I help you with that? Sure. He gets out, changes the tire for you. You try to offer him some money. He said, no, nah, I'm good, man. Thanks, man. Just pray for me. Right? I had a non-Muslim do this for me. Wallah ala I kid you not. I was coming out of the store one day, and I had my keys in my hand, and I think my son was with me. He must have bumped into me, and I dropped my keys, and he went down into you know, the drain. And I'm sitting here like, oh my gosh. I could see the keys down in the drain, but there was no way in the world I was going down there to get them. A guy came out. Uh, he was actually walking down the street, and he was actually intoxicated, drunk. You could smell the liquor on his breath. And he saw me looking, and he said, if I get those for you, I need you to do me a favor. I said, no, nah, don't worry about it. You know, I'll just call the, the company and, you know... I, I, matter of fact, I said that I'd go back in the store and try to get a wire hanger and stick it down there and try to get it. And he said, no, I'll get the keys for you. Don't worry. He said, I, I know how to do it. I got you. I got a white thobe every time. I'm like, I'm not getting down there. So I went in the store. I got the wire hanger. I came back out. He said, let me do this. He took the hanger from me. He put the curve at the end of it. He stuck it down there. We out there for about an hour. He trying to get it, sweating, everything. Finally, he gets the keys. I said, listen, man, I got about $25 in my pocket. I said, man, just here, take it. And he said, no, I, I, don't, I don't want your money. I said, well, how do I repay you? Like, you just took an hour to get my keys out of the drain. He said, pray for me, brother. Pray for me. I said, that's all you want? I said, like, you can get that anyway. I, I will pray for you regardless. But still, let me get He said, no, all I want from you is prayer. That's it. Just pray for me. And I walked away, and he said, Brother Muslim, don't forget about me, man. Don't forget about me. Pray for me. You know, I mean, like, who turned his heart to help me? 
You understand what I'm saying? Like that didn't just happen by coincidence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the changer of the hearts. We make dua, the Prophet sallallahu one of the most famous duas of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Allahumma ya muqallib al kulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh Allah, changer of the hearts. That's his name. Muqallib al kulub or his attribute, something he has described himself with. Muqallib al kulub changer of the heart. Change my heart to obedience to you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the changer of the hearts. So when the... Ibn Qayyim said that the qulub aniyatullahi fil ard, that the hearts are the vessels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, in the earth. The, the hearts is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicates love to his creation through the hearts of others from his creation. Someone just randomly shows you love, someone randomly just does something merciful for you, to you, for no reason at all. You have to understand that is Allah's way of conveying his mercy to you. Someone comes to you and praises you, says, you know what, you just, you know, I, I, I love you and your lectures, I, I benefited so much, you've changed my life. And when that comes to you as one of the Sahaba asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what, what about when somebody praises me? He said, this is the reward, the immediate reward of Allah and your reward in the hereafter is even greater. This is the immediate Reward of Allah when someone comes to you and says, Hey, you did this for me. Just look how your heart feels when somebody said, Yo, you did this for me. You can't imagine how much you've benefited me. You might have given someone a CD. Hey, hey, listen, this I was at Jumar the other day. Here, check this out. Sent someone a link. Hey, check this out. And the person comes back to you and says, Yo, I'm so glad you passed that on to me. I'm so glad you did this for me. So glad you did that for me. And it just makes you feel good. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's immediate reward and the reward in the hereafter is even better. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that the reward in the hereafter khayrun wa abqa it's better and even more lasting. Right? So understand. And on the flip side of that the heart is also the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can convey to you his anger. Someone has no mercy on you. Perhaps that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turning this person's heart and using that person to punish you. Absolutely. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةً أَتَصْبِرُونَ And we've made some of you a fitna for others. Some people Allah has made them a fitna for you because it's a punishment for you. And some people Allah has made them a fitna for you as a test for you. It all depends on you. We always ask all the time, how do I know if it's a, a punishment or a test? It all depends on you. If you're obedient to Allah, then it's a test. If you're disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a punishment and it's a test. <laughs> the same. So, the hearts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you ever seen a person... And you just like, for some reason, you just don't like this person. You don't even know why. Sometimes we interpret that as self-hatred. Maybe the person is African-American, you're African-American, you hate the way you look. So when you see them, you just automatically hate them. That's, that is true. They're, that is real. Self-hatred is real, without a doubt. But in some instances, it may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns your heart. And you don't like that person for reasons that you don't even know why. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is facilitating that anger to that person through you. Through you. Right? And you ever realize that once you like rectify your affairs, then your, your relationship with that person kind of gets a little better. Right? Sometimes it'll happen with an ex-wife and you got children between you. Right? And the marriage, the, the divorce is real ugly. And she's very angry towards you and you're very angry towards her. But then you realize when you start praying and you make it more dhikr and you make it more dua and you're getting closer to Allah, you start to find that that relationship starts to balance out in some instances. And some people are just eternally bitter and miserable. And unfortunately, you are going to be the brunt of that. There's just no way around that. So Islam, you know, places great emphasis on this organ called the heart. Very so many nusus, so many texts from the Quran and the Sunnah that put emphasis on this organ. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, and I'm going to recite the ayahs, I just, it's just something about the recitation of the Quran that um, is just more moving. Not only that, it's just my preferred way. Uh, I just prefer to recite the ayah opposed to just quoting it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالُ وَلَا بَنُونَ يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالُ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَا 
من أتى الله بقلب سليم. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, On the day when no wealth or no children will be of any benefit to you, only those who come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be qalbin salim. You come to Allah with a pure heart. Pure heart. Pure, free from any rancor, free from any anguish, free from any dislike, free from any hatred. People would come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with news about other people and he would turn away. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a pure heart. I don't want nothing in my heart for another believer. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, There's coming to you now a man from the people of Jannah walking on the earth. So one of the Sahaba said, Well, I want to find out why is he one of the people of Jannah walking on earth? What's so special about him? So he said, I followed him for three days straight. And I didn't see him do anything magnificent or great or out of the ordinary. He said, so I went to him and I asked him, I said, what is so special about you? That the Prophet Sallallahu when he saw you coming, he said, there's coming upon you a man from the people of paradise walking on earth. What is so special about you? I followed you for three days. I didn't see you do anything out of the ordinary. You pray like we pray. You give sadaqah like we give sadaqah. You fast like we fast. What's so special about you? And he said, I don't let a night go by that I have in my heart anything for another believer. Nothing. I have nothing in my heart for another believer. And so, you know, in moving towards, you know, having a more pure heart and soft and, and, and allowing your heart to be soft, we have to begin to repel negativity when it comes to us. When people come to you and say, hey, guess what this one said, that one said, nah, I'm good. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to put a lock on your emotional door and make people ask permission before they enter into your life with that stuff. Now, you don't get to just barge into my life with your nonsense and your negativity. You don't get to do that. You ask permission. Hey, I read something on the internet today. Can I share that with you? I might be in a good space. So I might say to you, well, you know, <laughs> I don't want to hear it. I'm, I'm, my day is good. I don't want to hear nothing negative today. I'm good. Miss me. I don't want to hear it. You, you have to ask permission. You don't just barge into, and we should have respect for each individual space. When we have space, we should respect that. I shouldn't just walk into your life and say, yo, guess what such and such said, and then just throw it in your lap and just destroy your entire day, right? Individual came to the Prophet Sallallahu informing him about what such and such did, and the Prophet Sallallahu said, the shaitan couldn't find anyone better than you to bring me this. The shaitan couldn't find anyone other than you to bring me this. Because when your day is turned upside down because of some information that somebody brought you, that's from the shaitan. Make no mistake about that. Shaitan's job is to make your life miserable in any way that he possibly can. And so we have to put up doors to make sure that people ask permission before they dump their negativity and nonsense off in our lives. All right. Um, so Islam places great emphasis on this organ that we call the heart. There are many texts from both the Qur'an and the Sunnah that highlight the importance of the heart and how vigilant the believer should be in making sure that the heart remains healthy. Once you get your heart, you work diligently to get yourself to a certain place, then you got to work just as hard to make sure you stay at that place. Some of us don't value our struggle. We struggle to get to a certain place, and then when we get there, we let anybody come into our lives and bring us right back down. When you struggle to get to a certain place in your practice of Islam, in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to work twice as hard to make sure that you stay at that place and maintain at that place. And that you don't allow people to come into your life and pull you back. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, فَإِنَّ الْقَلْبِ هُوَ الْمَلَكِ الْأَعْضَى وَالْأَعْضَى جُنُودُهُ He said that the qalb, the heart, is al-malik, it is the king. The heart is the king. And your body parts, the rest of your faculties, are its army. Your heart is king. And the rest of your body is your army. It's its army. He said, And he mentioned in, in, in Majmu'a Fatawa, volume 2, page 6. He said that the heart is the king. 
and the rest of the body parts are its army. He said, and the heart is that lump of flesh that the Prophet Wasallam said that is a lump of flesh in the body, that if it's healthy, then the rest of the body will be healthy. And if it is corrupt, then the rest of the body is corrupt. Indeed, that lump of flesh is the heart. It's the heart. You know, I said before, um, some brothers, they like to think that um, if I, they have a problem with women or they like women so much that it causes them to transgress certain boundaries. And sometimes in our delusion as men, we think that marrying another wife is going to help me solve that problem. So you ask them, well, why you want to marry another woman? Well, you know, women is a fitna for me. Well, women, what, what heterosexual man is women not a fitna for? Women is a fitna for all of us. <laughs> I don't understand that. I don't understand that connection. So you think that because women is a fitna for you, the way to solve that problem is to go out and get another wife. In street language, we call that hustling backwards. Because all you're doing is you're feeding the desire. You're feeding it by giving it another woman. Your issue is not that you have women as a fitna for you. Your issue is that women is a fitna for you, but you don't have the heart to combat it. So you use marrying another woman as your excuse not to attack the real problem. You marrying another woman is you fighting the symptom, not the root cause. The root cause that women is a fitna for you that causes you to transgress boundaries is because your heart is weak. And you got to go back to the source. The Prophet Sallallahu said, in the heart there is a lump of flesh. If that lump of flesh is sound, إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ That if that, heart of, heart of, uh, that lump of flesh is sound, then the rest of the body will be sound. That includes your private part. <laughs> you understand? That includes your private area. وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ إِذَا فَسَدَتْ and if that lump of flesh is corrupt, then the rest of your body will be corrupt. So if you have a problem with women, then the problem is not women, the problem is that you have not worked on your heart. You follow me? So in, by you marrying another wife, all you're doing is feed in the desire. And you're not going to the root of the problem, which is the weakness in your heart, the disease that is in your heart. So it's very important for us to understand that. A companion by the name of Wabisa ibn Ma'bad, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, uh, or the Prophet Sallallahu automatically knew why he was coming and the Prophet Sallallahu said to him, Jitta li tas'al anil bir. He said, you came to ask me about righteousness, didn't you? You came to ask me about righteousness, didn't you? The Prophet Sallallahu was aware of his companions, right? Very perceptive, was aware you know, he was one of those people, very intuitive, right? He could sense when something is wrong. You, we have to be people that can, you know, we have foresight, right? Al-Farasa, as the Prophet Wasallam said, beware of the Farasa, beware of the foresight of the believer. Because when you really fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah gives you certain qualities, gives you certain ilm that the average person would not have and be afraid of. And that is that when you truly fear Allah, Allah allows your faculties to function at a higher frequency than the average. Right? Going back to the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that my servant doesn't come close to me with anything that is more beloved to me except the fara'id, the obligatory. He said, and my servant continues to come closer to me with the nawafil, with the extra, the voluntary. Hatta uhibba, until I love him. Then what happens? There's a process. There's something happening when Allah loves you. He said, And then when I love him, I become his ears with which he hears, his eyes with which he sees, his hands with which he grabs, his feet with which he walks. You understand? Something is happening to your faculties because of your fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is functioning at another frequency that the average person who doesn't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even know how to understand. This is learning how to maximize, maximize, right? Maximize the faculties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. So he said to the Prophet, the Prophet said, Jitta li tas'al anil bir. You came to ask me about righteousness, didn't you? He said, Istafti qalbak. He said, ask your heart. Don't ask me, ask your heart. 
And this is equivalent to sometimes people come and say, Brother Imam, I have a question. You're like, okay, what's your question? Well, this is the scenario, this is the situation, and you're saying, you don't need my permission to, to you know, make your decision. Why do I need to validate you? Because a lot of times, brothers and sisters, you already know the answer to your question. You already know. The scholars, they say, Every human being is his own doctor. You know what your problems are, and you know how to fix that problem. You don't need a scholar's validation to go ahead and to say, you know what, I'm leaving this situation. Brother Imam, I'm having a problem with my wife. She's doing this. She doesn't validate me. She doesn't validate me. She doesn't do this. She doesn't do that. You know, should I stay in this relationship? It's like, dude, come on. You know the answer to that. It's not my job to tell you yay or nay. Ask your heart. You already know what to do. But some of us are in fear and we're hoping that the person that we're asking tells us to do the opposite because we really don't have what it takes to go that route. Wallah ala fear. Fear. And this is exactly how the Dajjal comes into the world and gets people to worship him based on fear. Fear. The Dajjal comes to a group of people and he says, worship me, I'm your Lord. They say, we're not going to worship you. The Dajjal told, tells the heavens, withhold your rain. He tells the earth, withhold your fruits and your vegetables. We'll see how long you remain firm. And then they worship the Dajjal. And then he tells the heavens, rain down on them, rain in abundance. He tells the earth, give forth, put forth um, fruits and vegetables in abundance. Right? You sold your soul for fear. And many in the Muslim community, especially the African-American Muslim community, you sold your entire community out for fear. Many in the Muslim community, students of knowledge, imams, whatever title you want to give yourself, you sold your community out for fear. And that, we can no longer have that. Our communities cannot function or be based upon fear. We will never get anywhere. When it's based upon fear, we have to learn how to make a decision and stand in our discomfort, even if the whole entire world goes against us. This is what our religion teaches us. Did the Prophet ﷺ not say this to Abdullah bin Abbas when he was on the back of the camel with him, right? On the donkey. And he said, Ya Ghulam, inni u'alimuka karimat. He said, Oh young boy, I'm going to teach you some words of wisdom. I'm going to give you some pieces of advice. And Ghulam, this means that he wasn't even the age of puberty yet. This is a 50-something-year-old man, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, dropping jewels on a 9, 10-year-old boy. Jewels that would stick with him for the, in, the duration of his life. Hadith that we quote on a day-to-day -day basis, but we don't live by. He told, the Prophet وسلم, told him, he said, to the end of the hadith, he said, Wa'alam. He said, and no. لو أن الأمة if an entire nation اجتمع على أن ينفعوك بشيء if a whole nation gathered together to benefit you with something they would only be able to benefit you with something that Allah has already decreed for you وإن اجتمع على أن يدروك بشيء لا يدروك أو لم يدروك إلا بما بشيء قد كتبه الله لك he said, and if they gather together to harm you with anything, they would only be able to harm you with what Allah has already decreed to happen to you. You can't do anything to me except what Allah has already decreed is going to happen. So whether you cow in the face, right, of this animal, this machine, you act like a coward, it's going to overcome you anyway. So it's only right to just stand on your own two feet in your discomfort even if the whole entire world goes against you. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa died and people said that they were not going to pay zakat. Abu Bakr said, Wallahi la'uqatilanna man mana'ani az-zakat walaw iqal. لو منعوني ولو إقالا كانوا يؤدونها إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لأقاتلنهم he said, I swear by Allah. He said, if they deny me even an iqal. An iqal is the thing that Saudis wear on their gutra, right? The red and white gutra, the black thing, right? That they wear on their heads to so hold it on. That's called an iqal. An iqal was used before it became 
the, the thing to hold the, the scarf on the head. Before it was that, it was used to keep the knee of the camel bent so the camel would lay down. All right, you want to keep a camel on the ground, you keep the knee bent. So when he bends his knees to go down, then you wrap the ikhal around the knee so he can't stretch the knee, therefore he can't get up. Right? He said, Wallahi, and I mean, this is something you can go buy in the souk, it doesn't really cost much. But the point that Abu Bakr was making is that if they deny me anything that they used to give the Prophet Wasallam for zakat, I will fight every single one of them. And Umar went back to Abu Bakr and he said, Abu Bakr said, uh, Omar said to Abu Bakr, how are you going to fight people who say, I bear witness to La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? How? And many of the Sahaba did not agree with Abu Bakr, but he stood in his discomfort. He knew it was right, and he was not budging on it. That's the type of leadership that we need in our communities. I don't care. But we read these hadith, we quote them when it's necessary, we quote them when it's convenient for us, but we don't act upon them. We don't believe in them enough to act upon them. And that's a problem. Because now we're just using Quran and Sunnah, we're just throwing around ayat and hadith just to sound, impress people and sound good. But when it comes down to it, when the fit hit the shan, we're not going to act on it. And that's a problem. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, مَا حَفِذْتُ حَدِيثٍ إِلَّا وَعَمِلْتُ بِهِ وَلَوْ مَرَّةٍ وَاحِدَةٍ لِأَلَّا يَكُونَ حُجَّةٍ عَلِيَّ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, I never memorized the hadith except that I acted upon it, even if it was just one time, so that hadith would not be a proof against me, يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ mm -hmm. Everything that you learn, everything that you memorize, it sounds good in front of everybody else, Allah is going to question you about that. The Prophet ﷺ said that the, the foot of the child of Adam will not move one step. يوم القيامة حتى يسأل عن أربع until he's asked about four things. And one of the four things you're going to be asked about عن علمك, on your knowledge, and how did you act upon it. You're going to be asked about that. So all of our leaders, our imams, and all of these people who hide behind these so fancy titles, you are going to be questioned about all of the knowledge that you have. I'm the head of the Islamic department. I'm the imam. I'm the student of knowledge of this one. And I sat with this shape for that amount of years. Yeah, that sounds good on paper. We know the community don't need your resume. Because <laughs> that's what you're given. You're given your resume. And for many of us in the Islamic community, we, we've only gotten your resume. We haven't gotten the real you. We, we haven't seen you perform yet. All we heard is your resume. And then to come back and see a, communal, uh, a community, come back to a community and see the community crumbling right in front of your face, talking about how many shakes you done sat with, how many years you done spent overseas, and what type of degree you got. Yeah, that's good, man. That's your resume. We want to see work. We want to see work put in in these communities, man. Grassroots, old-fashioned, hands-dirty work. That's what we want to see. And that's the type of leadership that we need. People who are able to stand in their discomfort even if the entire world goes against you. We like to say in this, you know, these cliches, me against the world, right? Me and Allah, me and God against the world. My God versus everybody, right? You see people with these slogans on their t-shirts and all of this other stuff, but you catch them in the corner, oh, they're going to cow down. They'll, they'll prostrate to you to get out of that discomfort. You sell your soul to get out of that discomfort. And then when everything is good, then you'll come back out and say, oh, I'm here, the imam, I'm here once again. Nah, man, you already showed your face. We see you for who you are. That's not the type of leadership that our children need. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Istafti kalbak, ask your heart. You want to know about righteousness? Ask your heart. He said, he said, Albir. He said, righteousness, matma'annat ilayhi an nafs. He said, righteousness is what your heart feels, your soul feels content with. When you do it, you don't have no rancor in your heart, nothing waver, no, you know, no, uh, you know, cognitive dissonance going, into, going on inside of you. In dissonance, this is this internal warfare that's going on inside of you because you know that what you did is wrong and it goes against what you believe, which is right. 
And so there's this internal thing going on inside. Like some of our imams who, you know, side with batil, side with falsehood, blatantly, clearly. And you got to live with yourself. And this is why the statement goes, a coward dies a thousand deaths. A coward dies a, de a thousand deaths. You got to live with that. You have to live with that. And to be honest with you, a lot of people, man, um, a lot of, you know, our leaders, man, unfortunately, they failed our communities, man. I'm just holding the mirror up to the community. A person can say, well, who are you to judge? Who are you to put yourself in that situation to be the judge? I'm not judging anything. I'm saying based upon the conditions of our communities, we got, we got failed somewhere. <laughs> Somebody failed us. Our children out in the street with tattoos and clubbing and shooting up. I mean, in Philadelphia, they're praying three, four, five janazas a week over our teenage boys that grew up in Islamic studies, going to you know Saturday, Sunday school, only to get 15, 16 years old, all the Quran you memorize, all of the money that we done spent on Islamic school out the window. Because from the ages of 14 to about 25, there is no leadership, no guidance. Everything is haram. Everything is haram. Toheed. All you got to do is stick to toheed and your life is going to magically fix itself. Unfortunately, this, this is what we feed in our children. And I mean, like, we, we got to take responsibility for that, man. It's not fair. It's not fair to them, man. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as he's telling this companion, has sometimes your judgment on what is right and wrong, your judgment is right here. You don't need a shake to validate that for you. He said, Isseti Kalbik, ask your heart. He said, Righteousness is that which your heart finds contentment with. He said, Well ifim ma hakaf in nefs wa turadud fi sadar wa in aftak in nas wa aftuk. He said, and sin is what wavers in the chest. Turadidu fil kalb. This is that dissonance. Psychologist calls it cognitive dissonance. This is what the Prophet ﷺ is saying here, that it wavers in the chest. You know what you did was wrong, because inside it went against your value system, which is right. He said, sin is what wavers in the chest. وَكَرِهْتَ أَنْ يَطَّرِعَ عَلَيْهِ النَّاسِ and you, and you hate for people to find out about it. You hide it. You hate for people to find out about it. He said, in nas." He said, even if people give you a fatwa, even if people give you Islamic ruler and tell you it's okay, deep down inside you know it's not okay. But we go against our heart. Your heart ain't gonna lie to you, man. Meaning people will tell you what they believe to be correct and may in fact be wrong, but your heart will never lie to you. Your heart will never lie to you. Your body, your heart communicates to you Physically, just like it communicates to you spiritually. What do I mean by that? Does our body communicate to us? Absolutely. When you've worked out too hard and your heart starts pumping really fast and you can't breathe, that's your body telling you you did something wrong. When you have a Charlie horse in the back of your leg, that means that there's something wrong, that your body telling you something is wrong, that your body communicating to you. You working out in the gym and you stretch something or you lift weights that are too heavy, you pull your back and the next day you wake up and your back is hurting. That's your body telling you you did something wrong. Your body communicating to you and our bodies will communicate to us physically. Yom al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Tafusilat, Surah number 41, ayat 19. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, حَتَّى إِذَا مَا جَاءَهَا شَهِدَ عَلَيْهِمْ سَمْعُهُمْ وَأَمْصَارُهُمْ وَجُلُودُهُمْ شَهِدَ عَلَيْهِمْ سَمْعُهُمْ وَأَمْصَارُهُمْ وَجُلُودُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ وَقَالُوا لِلْجُنُودِهِمْ لِمَ شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا قَالُوا وَانْتَقَنَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي أَنْتَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said حَتَّى إِذَا مَجَاءُهَا That when they come on a day of judgment 
وَشَهِدَ عَلَيْهِمْ سَمْعُهُمْ And their ears testify against them. Their eyes begin to testify against them. And their skin begins to testify against them about all of the things that they used to do. Oh yeah, your body gonna talk. Your ears gonna tell all the things you used to listen to. The backbiting, the music, everything. You think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you these faculties. And these faculties are not going to testify for you or against you. You are sadly mistaken. All of this is on loan. Every single piece of your body is given to you on loan. لِلَّهِ مَا أَعْطَى وَلِلَّهِ مَا أَخَذْ To Allah belongs what He gives and to Allah belongs what He takes. It's all His. You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you all of these faculties and you're just going to enjoy them and you're going to depart from this world and it's all over? La wallahi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ And then on that day, they will be questioned about every na'im, every blessing Allah gave you, you're going to be asked about it. Every blessing. Every single blessing Allah gave you, you are going to be asked about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on a day when they come to us, and their ears testify against them, their eyes testify against them, their skin testifies against them, all of the things that they used to do. وَقَالُوا لِجُلُودِهِمْ لِمَا شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا And this is a conversation that man is going to have with his body. Allahu Akbar. All the times your body was talking to you in this life and you never responded, I guarantee you, you respond on the day of judgment. You committed sin, you committed fornication and adultery. You slept with that woman. You slept with that woman. You slept with that man. And when you got up off of the bed, And you put your clothes on. You put your hijab back on. You wrapped your hijab. You put your crown back on your head after you slept with this man. And your heart is about to jump out of your chest because you know you did something wrong. And you ignore it. Your heart is talking to you. Your heart is telling you, make toba, repent. It wasn't right. And you ignored it. We numbed ourselves to our bodies when it's talking to us. I guarantee you, you talk back to your body, Yom al You slept with that woman. You unclothed that woman. And you placed your private in an area that was haram for you. Haram. You got up off of that person. And you felt bad. You felt like the worst person in the world. That was your body talking to you, telling you to make tawbah, reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And instead of doing that, we found the easy route out, and that is to numb ourselves to that spiritual awakening and to keep going in sin. But I guarantee you, on the day of judgment, when your body start talking, you will respond that day. You ignore it today. Tomorrow you will respond. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالُوا لِجُلُودِهِمْ لِمَا شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا And the human being will say to his body parts, Why are you testifying against me? لِمَا شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا Why are you testifying against us? And the body will respond back, قَالُوا أَن تَخْنَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي أَن تَخَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Allah is the one who told us to talk. The one who can make anything talk. Allahu Akbar. Allah is the one that told us to talk. Your issue is not with us. Your issue is with your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one that told us to talk. Just like the earth will tell its story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَانَهَا وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ وَثْقَانَهَا وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا يَوْمَئِذٍ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا بِأَنَّ رَبَّكَ أَوْحَى لَهَا On a day when the earth will give its narrative, it will tell its story. تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا يَعْنِيَ الْأَرْضِ On the day when the earth will tell its story. 
Because, see, we got our stories. We're going to tell our story. No, Allah, was it me? I didn't do it. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell the earth, Hadithu akhbara. Hadith akhbara. Hadithi, tell your narration, tell your story. Which is why some of the Sahaba, like Aisha and Uthman, and many of the Sahaba was reported on many of them, that when they would pray, when they finished their obligatory prayer, they would move to another place and pray their sunnah prayer. Because every place that your head touches, prostrates on the earth, will testify for you, Yom Al-Qiyamah. It will bear witness. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they will say, لِمَا شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا Why are you testifying against me? And our bodies will say that Allah is the one who gave us the ability to talk. The one who can give anything the ability to talk. And another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ نَخْتِمُ عَلَىٰ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ on the day when we will seal man's mouth shut. We're going to seal your mouth shut. And your hands are going to talk to us. And your legs are going to bear witness. All of the things that you used to do on this earth. So, if you ignore your body today, I guarantee you, you won't ignore it tomorrow. Some of us live a life of sin and we know we're dead wrong. And your body is screaming to you, make toba, repent, get back in touch with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reconnect with your Lord, and we ignore it. Inshallah later. Inshallah usalli fi mustaqbal. I'll pray later. And then sometimes later never comes. You're laying on your deathbed saying, I wish, yeah, late me. I wish. I wish. And even worse, when you reach your grave and you're saying, just send me back. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدَهُمُ الْمَوْتُ قَالَ رَبِّ رَجِعُونَ قَالَ رَبِّ رَجِعُونِ لَعَلِّي أَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا أَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا فِي مَا تَرَكْتُ كَلَّا إِنَّهَا كَلِمَةٌ هُوَ قَائِنُهَا وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ بَرْزَخٌ إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, until death comes to one of them, and they say, رَبِّ رَجِئُونَ Oh Allah, send me back. Send me back, give me another chance. Perhaps I can go back and do some righteous deeds that I forgot to do. So many prayers I missed. So many days of fasting I missed. Send me back. Let me make those up. And Allah says, Kella. No. It's just a frivolous statement that comes out of his mouth. No reality to it. And this ayat is also proof against the Hindu belief that there is no such thing as reincarnation. There is no reincarnation. There is no coming back. We do not believe in reincarnation. We believe in resurrection. <laughs> Understand? There is no reincarnate. There is no coming back to this earth in the form of a bird or in the form of some type of animal to, you know, atone for what you did the first time. No. Mm -mm. He said to Allah, Rabbi Ji'un, send me back. And Allah says, no. There is no going back. There is no going back. So, it's important that we, you know, speak to our bodies. And your body is telling you, your heart is telling you that it's hard and it needs to be softened. It's telling you, communicating with us. Rather, the most intimate and honest conversation that you can ever have is with your heart. One of the most intimate conversations that you can ever have with anyone is the conversation that you have with your heart. Conversation that you have with yourself. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Ya ibn al-Khattab, لَتَتَّقِيَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُعَذِّبَكَ اللَّهِ Umar said to himself, he said, Oh son of Khattab, you are either going to fear Allah or Allah is going to punish you. He's talking to himself. It's a conversation with himself. And unfortunately, you know, being preoccupied with this dunya, being preoccupied with work, 
children, play, sports, everything, we forget to have conversations with ourselves. We forget to look in the mirror and have that one-on-one, that heart-to-heart with ourselves. We're too busy having heart-to-hearts with everybody else. I need to give this brother some advice. No, you need to give yourself some advice. You need to give yourself some advice. No, you come first. The Prophet said, Iddat mi nafsika wa man ta'ul. Begin with yourself first and then those who are closest to you, those whom you are responsible for. Rect- you know, rectification of the community starts with self. That's it. You know. So, a sound heart, an uncompromised heart, will always communicate truth to you. Sometimes against your own biases and self interests. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونُ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَى الْأَبْصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَى الْقُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah to Hijr, uh, Surah to Hajj, excuse me, 22, I 46, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Don't they travel through the earth and they have with, with them they have with themselves hearts with which they can understand. You understand with the heart, you see the connection. That they have hearts with which they comprehend. Or they have ears with which they hear. For indeed it is not the eyes that go blind, it is the heart that are in the chest that go blind. You can see, يعني يبصرون بأبصارهم ولكن تعمى القلوبهم As the scholars of Tafsir say, they can see with their eyes, but you can't see with your heart. Blind. Blind. And this is the result of a hard heart that you can't see with your heart no more. You see with your eyes. And this is why when clarity is brought to the community about things that are going on that are detrimental to them, that are marginalizing them, that are stagnating them, that are stifling them, we fight against it. We say, oh no, that's not what's happening. That's not what's going on, right? Oh no, no racism in Islam. You got to stop with this nationalistic talk. No, (laughs) no. Because you're blind. It's almost like the Quraysh, like Allah said to the Quraysh, If they saw every single sign, they still not going to believe. You still not going to believe. The Prophet ﷺ split the moon right in front of them. And they say, Sukirat <laughs> Abasaruna. That our eyes, magic was played on our eyes, right? <laughs> I guess that's where you are right now, right? Many of the brothers and sisters who say, oh no, he's talking about nationalism and racism, whatever the case may be. Islam is a religion of peace. Islam is a religion without racism, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Got you. Which is why Saudi Arabia advertises for white-only teachers, right? Because there's no racism. So because I'm black, even though I have a degree, I'm not qualified to teach in Saudi Arabia because I'm not white, right? But then we'll say, because you're talking about advocacy for African-American Muslim communities who have always been, for the most part, in the Sunni community, have always been at the bottom of the totem pole, right? In terms of agency, in terms of community programs, activities. We've been stripped of all of that. Education, you name it. You name it. But then when we say we need to help African-American communities get their Islamic communities off the ground and help them reclaim their communities. Oh, it's nationalists. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. But do you go to an all Pakistani masjid and call them nationalists? <laughs> because they look out for their own? Am I a nationalist because I'm tired of seeing African American Muslim sisters passed around from brother to brother to brother? That doesn't go on in any other community but ours. Go to an Arab community and ask the sister how many times she's been married. Go to a Pakistani community, ask the sister how many times she's been married. And then go to the African-American Muslim community and ask the sister how many times she's been married. 
five times. In what world? In what community other than the African American community is a sister married five times? Please tell me. And we say nothing about it. But yet we'll tell you the shape refuted this shape and we got to push this agenda. But say nothing about the issues. So many of our children are growing up in households where four or five brothers have been married to their mothers. And they got four or five different stepdads, including a biological, biological bum father who don't even take care of them. The biological father don't take care of him. And the three brothers his mother been married to who are stepfathers don't take care of him either. And this is going to turn around and haunt our communities because these children are going to turn around and look at the Muslim community and say, you're full of crap. And if I wasn't in the message, I would say something else. You're full of crap because y'all talk all of this Islamic. We're all one ummah. We're all one community. In this community, you sat back. You watched my mother get married, passed around from brother to brother to brother. And y'all said nothing about it. Nothing. My mother passed around from brother to brother to brother. And you said nothing about it. Nothing. You didn't see anything wrong with that. And then we're telling the children, come back into the masjid and pray. Wait, why don't you come to the masjid? For what? For what? There's, there's no, you know, representation for my people in the masjid. What? For what? Understand what's going on here, man. Sister's been married four or five times. Asma bin to Umais was married three times in the Prophet ﷺ's community. But let me explain to you the three men she was married to and the three marriages she was in. <laughs> she started off being married to Ali's brother, Ja'far, Ibn Abi Talib. <laughs> All right? That's, that, that lets you know who her husband was, her first husband. She was married to Ja'far, Ibn Abi Talib. Married to him, had all her children with him, most of the children with him. When Jafar died, not divorced her, when he died, <laughs> she was a widow. Guess who married her after Jafar ibn Abi Talib? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, anhu, married her as a third wife. Honored her. Honored her while he was the Khalifa. He didn't marry the woman and put her on welfare. He married her and made her life better. He, en he en enhanced her life, made it better, and improved her quality of life. And gave her honor and status in the community. Our women get married as a second wife. She's a mistress, a jump off. For somebody who's too weak to concentrate on his own heart, he would rather marry another woman, bring her into his life, destroy her life so that he can appease his desire. Please. And I got to push the fatwa of this shake and that shake and not say anything about that? She was married to Jafar ibn Abi Talib. Then after Jafar died, she married Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Bakr was a Khalifa for two years. And then Abu Bakr died. She wasn't divorced. He died. She was a widow for the second time. And then guess who married her the third time? Jafar's brother Ali ibn Abi Talib. She became a second wife to Fatima, second wife to Ali, along with Fatima. His own brother married her, honored her. You understand? Honored the woman. So she was married three times in the community, but it wasn't due to divorce, and it wasn't due to some deadbeat, you know, privileged men who feel like they're entitled to poly polygyny. That's my right. How are you going to deny me my right? It's your right when you qualify for it. Qualify for it first. As Sister Zara Johnson, Zara J, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you, Sister Subhanallah. She said, if a brother wants to go into polygyny, try this before you do it. She, he, she said, take a sister, not the sister that you intended to. Take any random sister. Because if it's the sister you married to, you're going to be compromised. Take a random sister in the community and pay her rent for six months. Take on all her financial responsibilities for six months. And then that'll let you know how deep you about to get yourself in financially marrying another woman. Facts, man. Facts. Make a man say, you know what, I'm good on that. 
I'm good on polygyny, man. Even after I read that, I was like, all right, I'm cool with what I got. I'm good on that. <laughs> right? Real talk. These women are tired, man. They're tired. And they have no advocacy from the men in the community, the leadership in the community, because we're too busy talking about Sheikh Rabia warned against this one, and Sheikh Fulan is warning against that one, and stay away from that one. We're so busy and preoccupied with that, we say nothing about our issues, nothing. And in the moment we do, oh, I don't agree with this. Oh, I don't agree with that. Man, you can take your I don't agree with that self somewhere else, because as far as I'm concerned, you don't represent our communities. Students of knowledge, imams, it is what it is, man. I, I don't bite my tongue, man, and I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm growing less and less diplomatic. The diplomacy is what got us into this. Oh, you shouldn't have said the brother's name in public. Oh, you shouldn't have did this. Oh, you shouldn't have said that. Well, when was the last time I heard you say something, player? <laughs> I haven't heard you say anything. But yet you in the background criticizing and commenting on what somebody who had the guts to stand up and say something. While you sitting from behind a keyboard talking about, oh, you shouldn't have mentioned the Sheikh's name. Oh, you shouldn't have said this. Oh, I don't agree with that. Well, please um, do the lecture and show me how it should be done. I'll wait. <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> you ain't going to hear nothing from none of them. I guarantee you a year will go by from today and you will hear nothing. Nothing. They don't represent our communities, man. They don't. And I'm just, you know, I'm tired, man. I'm tired. The day, not even a day after I gave that lecture last week, you are all students of knowledge talking, oh, you should have said this, oh, you shouldn't have said that, oh, you shouldn't have did it like this. Well, then say something. So show, show me how to do it the right way, please. I'll wait. Because <laughs> before I said something, nobody said anything. And I, that's, that's not to say that I was correct in everything that I said. But we can deal with that later. Let's reclaim our communities first. And we can deal with that later. It's almost like the, 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 the conflict between Muawiyah and, and Ali. Muawiyah wants retribution. We want blood. They slaughter, they kill Ali. Uh, they kill Uthman. We want blood. And Ali's like, no, we need to get the community back in order. Without law, there's no order. Let's get the community in order. We go back and handle that later. Uh, it's the same conflict. But the fact of the matter is that Ali and Muawiyah were both on the front line. We got conflict with students of knowledge who sit from a place of privilege and critique and comment. You want to be a commentator? Then be a commentator. You want to be a student of knowledge? Then you stand in your discomfort. You take your rightful place and you stand at the forefront of your community and you defend what's right. You don't get to sit behind a computer and criticize and critique. You don't get to do that. So the heartening of the hearts has reasons and repercussions, all of which this particular book of softening the hearts uh, deals with. Sorry, we don't have time to go through that. Maybe the next time I come to New York, inshallah, um, we can deal with some of the reasons that or the matters that the matters that soften the heart. So inshallah ta'ala, we'll deal with that in the next class, inshallah. We, we don't have time. Um, there's about six matters I mentioned, um, and hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we'll find some time to address, you know, the matters that soften the heart, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Um, and we'll stop here. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salama taslimin kathira wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I don't know if there were any questions. I got time for like maybe two questions, inshallah, before I go. But also, um, for those of you who are aware, we are having, um, we are having um, a discussion tonight, a, a further discussion about some matters that came up. Um, so uh, if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see the flyer for the discussion tonight. It's a call-in number. Uh, and then there's a pin number right there so you can actually call in and listen to the discussion and chime in on the discussion if you have something you want to contribute. And this discussion is going to be more so dealing with some of the some of the things that people said, is racist, is he a racist, is he a nationalist, whatever the case may be. We need to start identifying these terms because we be throwing terms around and we don't even understand what it means. Afro Afrofuturism? Afro What's that? I, I never heard that one. Afro-futurism. 
Wow. Yeah, I have a question. Shoot. I know you, you, you spoke about community and stuff like that, but I somehow feel that um, in the societies that we live in the United States, everybody is so involved in their daily struggles and you know, their daily bills and all of that stuff. Like, they don't see the vision of giving and sharing. Allah talks a lot about, you know, give, you know, rewards for giving, giving. So, individuals are not engaged in giving, so they're not able to see the vision of building. They're not sacrificing. You know, the society demands so much of our energy. Mm, good our point. Obsession. Good point. He said society demands so much of our energy and our possessions that we've lost sight of the power of giving, you know, you know, and building, you know, and, and creating agency for ourselves because we are very busy with working, very busy with school, very busy with, you know, children and things like this. It, it almost makes it almost impossible for us to, in, you know, exert that same energy in our Islamic communities. One of the things that we'll talk about tonight is one of the incentives to help build our communities is our children. That's our greatest incentive. Our greatest incentive is looking at the next generation of Islam. And if not for ourselves, for them. We, you know what I mean? Like we, can, we can't just leave our children if you know, we die now. We can't just leave our children in the state that they're in right now. We have to build institutions. We have to create agency where we can have money coming into the community instead of just following the same blueprint of brothers give sadaqah. You got the biggest you know, African-American brother just came home from prison. He holding a bucket at the door. Sadaqah, brothers give sadaqah. You know what I mean? Like it's intimidating. We, people shouldn't have to be intimidated to give sadaqah, to give charity. People should want to give because they understand the value of giving. Endowments. We should take you know, the top 1% of our the Islamic communities. We got one percenters here. We got six figure men and women in our communities. We can take the one percent from the Muslim community and start making them create endowments. All right, you're gonna buy a building and you're gonna give that to the Muslim community. You're not gonna put your name on it. That belongs to the Muslim community. You don't take a dime from that. And that is left for the Muslim community to benefit. You know, uh, books. You know, literature and things like this, we're going to take money. We need to tap into our wealthy 1% from amongst the Muslim community. We have them. Six-figure, seven-figure men and women in our communities, we have them. We have them. They exist. But one of the reasons probably why they don't give is because they don't see the value in giving. Why am I going to invest my money in, you know, come on, I don't, I don't see anything that's worth me giving. Yes, brother. I mean, obviously, when a person is functioning on a, on a higher frequency, you know, in terms of money and power, status and things like that, they don't think in terms of, you know, the immediate needs that we think of. We're here on the ground in the community. So for them, it may not may not necessarily be a priority, but for us, it is. And we have to make them see that establishing something, building something is a priority. We should reach out to them. Absolutely. We have to reach out to them. Fundraising, dinners, you know, whatever the case may be, to do what is necessary to expand, create institutions, take our children out of these public schools, take our children out of these charter schools, take our children out of these private schools, put them in Islamic schools, Islamic institutions that are established by us, for us. By us, for us. Why do we keep sending our children? And, and then the sad thing about it is that we send in our children to Islamic school, uh, to public school, and many of the Muslim teachers work in the public school. Why can't we pull our teachers? These are our resources. Our resources. And they're working in the public school. No. Pull them out of the public school and begin to create agency for our communities. And it's not just for the African-American community. This blueprint can be laid down and be followed by any community. We just need the blueprint. We have the resources. Money is not an issue. Never been an issue in the Islamic community. We have money. Money is not the issue. Space is not the issue. It's vision that's the issue. We don't have vision. We don't have people amongst us who 
we do have people that have vision, but you know what has happened to them? They've been chased away. Because they've been told that their vision is, you know, this is a Kafir thinking, non-Muslim thinking, you know, too worldly thinking. So then we stay where we are with nothing. You're too much involved in business and politics and we'll use every excuse in the book not to act upon a vision, not to lay down a vision. All right, this is what is classic Muslim behavior. We'll dismiss without replacing, without an alternative. We'll say, no, 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 we can't do that. That's haram. Okay, well, what's the alternative, Tayyip? What's the alternative? Please give me. But we can't just say, that's haram, we're not going to do that or that doesn't fit into our scheme and what we're trying to do. Okay, then what does? <laughs> just staying the way we are? No. We, we have to make something happen. And it's not going to happen by people sitting around at the table saying, oh, no, we can't do that, we can't do that, and then we walk away with nothing. I just want to share one more thing. Um, I've traveled around many communities. Um, you know, I know this, I mean, you said this earlier today, too, is, um, you know, we're so busy having takeout dinners and all these little frivolous programs, but we do not really know the needs of our neighbors. We do not know if they have a child who has difficulty. We do not know what religion they belong to or what hardship they're experiencing. You know, there are you know, communities where the neighbors are completely not Muslim and they were never invited to the mosque for a simple meal. What you're talking about is outreach. We don't have any outreach programs in the Islamic community, especially not on the East Coast. Maybe you go further west, further south. You know, you may have some other Islamic communities that seem to have their thing, you know, set up. One of the things that the Masjid in Cherry Hill, New Jersey did was they started a free clinic, free health clinic. And that's open even for non-Muslims. That is an excellent way to give da'wah. Excellent way to give da'wah because you're offering a free service to the community, which you should be doing anyway. As Muslims, Allah made us the caretakers of the world. That's our responsibility. We are the humanitarians. And the Prophet ﷺ is the blueprint. The greatest humanitarian that ever lived. You know what I mean? So, I mean, why not? But yes, we're talking about outreach. We're talking about social services. All of these things... We have the resources for these things, but we're not, we don't have any vision. We don't have a vision. And we don't have something to work towards because of the lack of the vision. So we need our leadership to lay down for us a blueprint, a vision that we can work towards. At least we have something now, a trajectory. We have something now that we can work towards. And then once we arrive at that, we can mark that off of the list and we can start on the next thing. And then it's project after project and our children see us building, they're going to automatically come back to the masjid. Because everybody wants to be a part of the winning team. And when you see people winning, you want to be a part of that. Now. I'll, I'll speak on the graduates that are in the uh, The PhD in Mashallah. So, I was talking about like, why don't we have something like, you guys go study there for 10, 15, 20 years of your life. Why can't you guys teach here? He said he's only one person. But I was thinking like, every year there are hundreds of thousands of people graduating. Where are they? Like, I see a lot of them driving Uber or working for Delhi. Why can't we have something the graduates can really teach? Because if I want to say I'm going to learn Arabic or Hadith, we really don't know where to go actually. Uh, and and, well, and I, I sent some brothers we saw, they want to learn something. They come out like the, the Sheikh's book. Forget Hadith, they learn no Hadith. So we don't have an actual in America, like maybe there is, but there's not an actual program where you really learn Hadith, Quran, Tafsir with actual. Qualified people who already graduated, because the qualified people they're just learning, they're just doing taxes. Right. And people who did not qualify, they're teaching the sheikh's book. Yep. There you go. The whole opposite. And the Prophet ﷺ warned us about the changing of the times and things will be, as he called it, sa'at, uh, um, uh, uh, sanawat khida'at. These are years where everything will be flipped around. So the educated person will be considered ignorant and the ignorant person will be considered educated. So now you have students of knowledge who graduate from the university with degrees, formal study, and, and, and these prestigious universities come back to America and they're driving Uber, they're working odd jobs, driving trucks, doing odd things, and I mean they have to provide for their families. But they're not in our institutions teaching. But the people that are in the institutions that are teaching are people who haven't graduated from the Arabic you know, program. You, you have people who are unlearned, you haven't studied anywhere, self-taught, self-learned, self-studied, right? These are the people that are in the occupying the institutions teaching. I called out the names of those individuals last week. 
They, they, I called out names of individuals last week who are occupying positions of leadership, have never studied at the feet of any scholar anywhere. No degree in anything Islamic. But yet you teach in major sciences like Jarh wa Ta'adil. Let me tell you something about Jarh wa Ta'adil. In the Islamic University, right? Islamic University of Medina. I graduated from, Mufti graduated from, Tahir graduated from, and his undergrad study. We all graduated from the College of Hadith. There are five colleges on the campus of the Islamic University. The College of Sharia, Islamic Law and Fiqh. The College of Quran, the College of Da'wah, the College of Hadith and the College of the Language of Arabic, all right? In the College of Hadith, this is a university, this is actually one of the colleges uh, that people were literally terrified to go into. I know students who went, started off in the College of Hadith, and in the next semester, they were somewhere else. The College of Hadith is the only college on the university campus that teaches Jarah wa Ta'adil. Because it is a science connected to the sciences of hadith. So the only people in the entire Islamic university campus that studies the science of jarh wa ta'adil is a, is a student of hadith. So, that leads me to my next point. How does a person who has never studied on the Islamic university campus, has never studied in any, not Ezhar, not any Islamic university, not the Islamic university of Ahlu Hadith in Pakistan, not anywhere. How do you teach Jarah wa Ta'adil? Because the scholars don't teach Jarah wa Ta'adil. You're not going to find any scholar, any sheikh, sitting outside of the university, whether in the Prophet's Masjid or anywhere else, Teaching Jarah wa Ta'adil. The only place that you get Jarah wa Ta'adil is on the university campus in the College of Hadith. And you don't even get it in your first year in the College of Hadith. You get it in the second year, in your second semester, and the third year in your first semester. You have two semesters of it. So please tell me, a person who has never studied anywhere, anything Islamic anywhere, how are you teaching Jarah wa Ta'adil? How does the word Jarah wa Ta'adil even come out of your mouth? You are not by any standard allowed to teach anything Islamically. You have no ijazah, you have no sign off from any scholar that said you are proficient in any science of Islam. None. But what you do have is you have endorsements from scholars who you promote. Sheikh Rabia said, you are a mountain of knowledge. How in the world, with all due respect to Sheikh Rabia, how in the world are you a mountain of knowledge? You were just selling pizzas and playing soccer. You were selling pizzas and playing soccer. You go from selling pizzas to playing soccer to being a jabal al-ilm, mountain of knowledge. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, mundu meta. Since when are you a mountain of knowledge? You have another scholar telling people to migrate, make hijrah to the UK to sit with Abu Khadija, who does not have a degree in anything Islamic, no ijazah from any scholar in any science of Islam. As a matter of fact, Sheikh Wasi Allah Abbas told them to stick to translating books. That's all you can do. That's all you should be doing. With your level of Islamic education, the only thing that you are qualified to do is translate books from Arabic to English. That's it. And you go from that to teaching sciences of Jarh wa Ta'adil. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. And we, we drank the Kool-Aid. We drank it. All of it. Every single drop of the Kool-Aid, we drank every drop of it. Yeah, last one. So basically you're saying like wealthy families are basically looking to be a part of communities that are more like them. Yep. So they don't necessarily invest in communities that are not necessarily. 
I mean, I get. You. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's also like a personal problem. I mean, they probably will give to the communities, but when it comes down to the marriage part, where they can actually, if they want to marry like someone saw their daughter or vice versa, and they want to marry, but the person might be from a more poor family, where they could get, you know, but they were seeking marriage, but they also have a good deed with the work. That that's gonna that's gonna forever be our problem. <laughs> that was the problem during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That I don't think that that is going to change anytime soon. <laughs> and he's talking about you know wealthy families who you know they have daughters or they have sons or whatever, and they won't marry into other families that are maybe not so well to do to maybe help bring those families up. I mean, those are few and far in between. I mean, that happened even during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You had wealthy people who would refuse. You know, Julaybib was one of them, right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked Julaybib, but to Zawaj, are you married? And Julaybib said, Men yuzawijun ya Rasulullah. Look at me, who, who would marry me? Who would marry somebody that looks like me? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to a man from the Ansar and said, give me your daughter. He said, yeah. I'm giving my daughter, I would love to have you as my son-in-law, messenger of Allah. He said, I'm not asking for your daughter for me. He said, well, who are you asking for my daughter for? He said, Julie B. He went to the mom and the mom said, Wallahi, Wallahi, I would never marry my daughter to Julie B. Ebedin. I would never marry my daughter to Julie B. So, I mean, that was a problem even during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And this is why we need advocacy. We need Islamic leadership to set vision for us. SOP. Standards of practice, you know, um, a lot of things has happened in our communities, and this is another thing we want to talk about tonight. And I have to go if we're going to talk about this tonight. Um, um, but we need to talk about standards of practice in our communities, setting a standard, certain things that we cannot allow to happen anymore in our communities. Imams cannot be guilty of certain behaviors. And then when it's found out that they're guilty of certain behaviors, we just turn a blind eye to it and allow them to continue leading in the community. No. La wallahi. La wallahi. And that applies to anybody. Nobody. Nobody is above the law. You violate a, a young woman. You violate anybody. You are removed from that position. And you are no longer allowed to teach in our communities. We have kicked people out of masjids and not banned them for teaching for just not agreeing on an opinion. But then we'll allow somebody who clearly violates a, a woman in the community and we'll continue allowing them to teach. Like how backwards is that? Here it is, this brother qualified, graduate from the university, he can't teach in the masjid because there's a question mark over his head because he doesn't agree with my position about Shadid or this one or that one. So he can't teach in the masjid, right? But then the person who is teaching there's a question mark over his head in terms of his muru'a, in terms of his integrity and his morality, but we still let him teach. I mean, like, how backwards is that? And I mean, here we are. This, this is our situation. So, but, you know, alhamdulillah, I think that, you know, since last week, I think conversations in our community have definitely changed. The, the sitting at dinner table, is the conversations are no longer the same. And people are at least thinking in terms of some of the things that we need to change and we need to fix and directions we need to work towards. So I, I see that to be something that is good, positive, and it's happening and it takes time, but it also takes commitment. We have to be committed to change. Change is not something that is just going to fall in your lap. You got to work for it. In Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim that Allah will not change the condition of a people until at first they change what is within their hearts. We have to be committed to change by all means and by any means within our sharia to bring about change in our communities. And you'll see as time goes on when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees that we're really serious, the tawfiq will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bi'idhnillah. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah wa salam wa Allah is a khair habibi. Dawah to come inshallah. Ma'ashallah. Allah khair inshallah.